So the instructions are explain why this integral is improper, then determine whether or not the improper integral converges or diverges. If the integral converges, find its value. So go easy. Go easy on your cards. So, improper has <laughs> merge and diverge. Show me. Because it's improper, it's easy to see it's looking right at you. Yeah. Improper because it is infinite. infinite. You fix that, right? You write that with a letter, pick your favorite letter, compute that as a function of n, and then take the limit as n goes to infinity. You finished it yet? I hope so. How do you compute the integral? The u to u. The u to u, u is going to be to the negative one third power. So when you add one to a negative one third, we get a positive two thirds. Then we're going to multiply that by three halves. And so our integral looks like three halves times u to the positive two thirds, and u is x plus two. And we evaluate that from zero to infinity. Zero to n and n to infinity. And it gets sloppy on you. So we have three halves n plus two to the two thirds. Minus three halves of two to the two thirds. So what's your interpretation of that limit? Infinity. That's right, this is a positive power. So this is gonna keep growing as N grows. So this limit is infinite. And our conclusion is the integral diverges.
our second one. This is an improper integral. Yes? Tangent of pi over four is one and one minus one is zero. This becomes undefined in the integrand when x is pi over four. That's the only point in there, right? Tangent of power four is one, one minus one is zero in the denominator. So we put a letter right there. Coming in from the left side of pi over four, then you're gonna figure out how you're gonna integrate this. And get a function of B out of it. Quick jaunt around the corner. Anybody know how to get this integral started? Yeah. How? It's, a it's another u du integral because the derivative of the denominator yeah. is the numerator, give or take a minus sign. So you're going to do this by taking u to be the denominator. And then du is a minus secant squared of x dx. So we'll put the minus sign over here. And so we're integrating minus the integral of one over u du. We get a logarithm. Mm -hmm. We get minus the natural log of u, which would be minus the natural log of one minus the tangent of x. 
and x goes from zero to b. So we get minus the natural log of one minus the tangent of B. And when I put a zero in there, what's the tangent of zero? Tangent is zero, zero. So I get the natural log of one, which is also zero. So let's put that there to show that off. What's your conclusion? The convergence. Yes? Oh, wait, wait, wait. You said tangent of pi over four no, was one. Much. One minus one is zero. What happens to a logarithm at zero? Yes, sir. It's undefined, right? And log of zero goes to minus infinity. So this term goes to minus infinity. That will change the sign, make it go to infinity. This one diverges. Well, that ain't no fun. We need to find one that converges. So the natural log of zero is infinity. Can you Minus infinity, actually. Can you explain that? Here's the graph of a logarithm. So as you go towards zero, the logarithm okay. goes to minus infinity. Okay, then, then, let's look at this integral, these numbers off. We're going to talk about the integral one over x, natural log of x to a power. So before I put numbers on here, there are two places that make this denominator zero. Where are they? Zero. X is zero and x is one. So if I did this, I'm good. But now I've got an improper integral. And my question is, what size does p have to be? in order for this integral to converge. For what values of the power here will this integral converge? To find out, integrate it. Any P, that's me. <coughs> One more. <coughs> Excuse me. Oh gosh, is there more? Ah. Let me see. Oh, thank you. I'm going to just keep sneezing while you work. So just integrate away with an N up there, and then decide what that power has to be so that all your steps will get you a convergent integral.
what steps do you take to integrate this? U D U. U D U. U is what? Use the natural log. And so this other part here is the D U. So you're really integrating U to the minus P D U. Okay, keep going. You add one to the power and divide by the new power. Well, already I have to eliminate one number for P. P can't be one. Otherwise, I'm dividing by zero here. So for P not equal to one, I can do that step. And then we're going to put the natural log of x back in. So I get the natural log of x in here. Let me write that as 1 minus p, maybe. And then we're going to evaluate that from 2 to n. N goes in first. And then the other number is just a constant. So we need to know what makes that limit right there in front exist. Yes, sir. The value of P greater than one. Because? because that's going to make the natural log of n to some negative power, which you're going to put it in the denominator. Need in the denominator, right? Because we know this grows as n grows. So if this is smaller than one, then it's going to keep growing. But if p is bigger than one, that makes the exponent negative, and we need it negative so that it moves down to the denominator. Then let it grow all at once. If it's in the denominator, then this value is going to go to zero. Agree? So we need P bigger than one. P bigger than one makes this go to zero. So there's the value of our limit right there. So for P bigger than one, this integral will always equal minus the natural log of two to the one minus P over one minus P power. All right, now let's play that same game and let's put the two up here and make the lower limit one. Same question. Take out the integral from one to two of that same integrand. Now this is the problem point. Natural log of one is zero. It makes our integrand undefined. So now we're computing this as a limit as our letter goes to one. And all the other steps follow that we did before. So everything from here on out is the same. We get down to here. We also can't let P be one. P is equal to one is trouble. So we're down to here. 
but now we've got the other numbers to go in. I guess if P is one, we've got a logarithm, don't we? Why didn't we do that case? <coughs> yeah, what if P is equal to one? If P is equal to one, then that's just a... It's because of the denominator. If P is equal to one, then we've got a logarithm, right? So for the case P is equal to one, we have the integral of U to the negative one, which is the natural log of U which is the natural log of the natural, log. natural log of x which from where? 2 to n? Well, that diverges, doesn't it? Natural log of n grows, so the natural log of the natural log of n grows. So this is infinite as well. Well, I guess we need to consider that case. I can't just throw it away. So the two cases, um, if P is equal to one, and then P is not equal to one. So if P is equal to one, this thing becomes the natural log of the natural log of X. And we're gonna take the limit as A goes to one from the right of the natural log of the natural log of X from A to two. So that's the limit as A goes to one from the right of the natural log of the natural log of two, that's well-defined, minus the natural log of the natural log of A. So what's your conclusion here? Still diverges. A goes to one. Natural log of one is zero. zero. Natural log of zero is trouble. So this becomes infinite. So this one diverges for P is equal to one. If P is not one, then we get this thing. And we're looking at the limit. As A goes to one from the right of the natural log of x, x, <laughs> all to the one minus p over one minus p to be evaluated from a to two. So, spam that out. I get the natural log of two to the one minus P over one minus P. So now that works for any value of P minus the natural log of A <coughs> one minus P over one minus P. So what's the natural log of A going to do when A goes to one? This goes to zero. So zero has to be raised to a positive power. Otherwise, it's in the denominator. So this is the opposite. We need one minus P to be a positive number. We need, I'm off the board. We need one minus P to be positive. Keep that in the numerator. So we need P to be smaller than one. Well, P is on the smaller side. So that one's the opposite. And we needed P bigger than one to put it in the denominator as the expression goes to infinity. Here our expression is going to zero, so we need it in the numerator. So it's the opposite. Okay. 
think that's all I want to say about that. Is this a real ocean of rest for the test, or is this more for the fun? I enjoyed it. <laughs> It might be something you already recognize. Right? We did some version of that the other day. We're going to see terms like this when we talk about series. And knowing when the series gets big is going to be important. Okay, so let me give you then, unless you have any questions, any questions about any web work going on with you or life in general? Can you do one of the problems from 7.5? I can. Okay. Um, Nobody told me I didn't have a 7.5 web workup. I don't know. Is that some sort of conspiracy? Yes. We figured you were aware. You just kind of imagine that you I, skipped it because we did like the 22 problems. There are two, three steps. <laughs> you the assignment. And you open the assignment. And then you assign the assignment to the students. I forgot to assign the assignment. I kept looking at student progress. And I, what? They have nobody's progressed on it. It wasn't assigned to me. So I had to click that one more button. And now it is. So get busy. Section so, 7.5. What's the problem? Okay, so it's the integral of e to the x over um, the polynomial e to the x minus 5 times e to the x plus 5. Okay. Did it make you think about anything? Did you see problems that looked like this? Partial fractions. Yeah, partial fractions. I'm thinking partial fractions as well. So we can make it look like our partial fractions problems if you take u to be e to the x and then d use e to the x. And then it looks like a polynomial instead of an exponential function. So if I take u to be e to the x, d is also e to the x. And then we're integrating polynomial type problems. One over u minus five times u plus five. EU. So our experience tells us we should be able to break that up into two fractions, something over u minus five, something over u plus five. We just have to find the somethings. So while I erase, you find those somethings. One tenth and negative one tenth. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. And then it says, what if you need to just five? Plug it okay. in. Okay. And then that's zero. E to the X is equal to five. And that would make that zero. That would make five plus five to A, but that gives me one half. So I did something wrong. So this is going to be the integral of one tenth over two minus five plus one minus. I think we're going to be able to split that up. When you put you back in, will it fix it? Let's see. We're going to integrate that. <laughs> that's one you can't integrate this oh that's an e to the x yeah this has to be because when you put wait yeah this is it messed up up there this way no it shouldn't it's sucked up by the constant finish your way i'll finish my way All right, let's see. I got a A was over to U minus five, so A was one tenth. And then I get a one tenth. So I'm going to get one tenth natural log. Of U minus five minus one tenth natural log of U plus five. And each U was E to the X. I'm gonna factor out the one tenth. So you can't integrate this thing. One over e to the x minus one. No, you need your e to the x. And yeah, that. but if you do it this way, that's that's equal to that, right? That's equal to that, and so. And then you multiply both by this. You get a to the right. e to the x. Right, you've got to have your u and your du in there. Yeah. You've got to go back to u. So that means this doesn't equal this, right? Right. Right. You're going to have to convert to you. Okay. okay. Anything else? Okay. All right, so I want to introduce you to hyperbolic functions. Um, they will be on the our next test. They'll be on anybody's test, but you'll see them maybe. Hyperbolic functions are linear combinations of exponential functions. So most of us can get around having to use a hyperbolic function because we know how to use exponential functions. But in some settings, <laughs> exponential functions of this type appear over and over, particularly in physics and electrical engineering. And so you'll use hyperbolic functions as kind of ways to shorten all this junk that you have to write. But so if you're just hanging out doing mechanical engineering, uh, you guys are essentially technicians anyway. You don't care why things work. You just want to make them work. Isn't that right? Yes. Yeah. Just shoot somebody down right there. I can say that. My son's a mechanical engineer. Sorry to make fun of him for taking the easy route when my other son is a football coach. <laughs> that, that is hard engineering. 
What I level of patience for that? Yeah. He's going to tell teenage boys how great they are. Wow. <laughs> so he's a high school football player. No, he's a college football coach. Oh. He's got to convince teenage boys that they're great. Now come play for me so I can berate you and tear you back down. <laughs> Where does he coach? He's at Houston Baptist. They are currently O and four. <laughs> Maybe O and five. Is he, is he the head coach? No, he's special teams oh. coordinator. Oh, it's not his fault. His special teams are like best in the conference. Exactly. That's my boy. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what? He never played, he did play special teams one time. He was quarterback at Lubbock High. Anybody know Lubbock High's proud tradition of football? Uh, uh, yeah. uh. <laughs> we would literally play them like once a year. And we they're, they're really horrible. Mm -hmm. When my son was in high school, they go there. Really, really horrible. And he was the quarterback, which meant he got the beat out of him every single game. <laughs> I'm sure you were very proud. I was very proud. He, was, he played college football. Oh, wow. Really? Going from Lubbock High, winning a grand total of zero games. zero games in two years as the starting quarterback. <laughs> so he had to go to Wisconsin to play college football. He had to go somewhere where they did not know this proud tradition at Lubbock High. <laughs> and he did. He started as a freshman. Wonderful. His quarterback got both shoulders torn up. That was the end of his career. <laughs> Not really. I mean, his hook shoulders he healed, but that was the end of him being a starter. Because if your quarterback can have to throw like this. <laughs> but anyway, he played, he played three years at a place called Carroll University. And then he graduated early because he went to Lubbock High. <laughs> and played one more year at Case Western University and got his master's. So going O and whatever at Lubbock High got him two free degrees. I mean, you don't have to put your record. You just have to put that you were the quarterback. Yeah, that's right. But he did play special teams one time in high it. school. He was the up guy on the punt. And I thought, oh, my God, why did they put him there? And one of the guys played for Friendship, also played baseball here at Texas Tech, Stephen Smith. No way. Big, big that's guy. guy. But he didn't like my son for one reason. I don't know why. They competed against each other for all of their lives. He took him out on that up punt, knocked him 20 yards backwards. <laughs> he wasn't going for the punter. He had his eye on my son. and went, boom. He, my son left his feet. He was up in the air. I'm just looking at it like this. <laughs> well, I'm glad it, I'm glad it happened against my alma mater. <laughs> and now he coaches football and special teams, which I thought was hilarious. I graduated. <laughs> Pose, but like, I don't know, that just goes wrong. Okay, so a catenary describes a curve that looks something like this. So this is just for fun. This is an introduction. There won't be much fun with that pen. So this is an introduction to hyperbolic functions. When you do see them again, you say, oh, yeah, we talked about them. Thank you. Thank you. Are we going to see them again? Of course, they're in Cal 3. or uh, Maybe in Cal 3, maybe in 50Q. This is section 7.8. So let me see if I can spell this. Catenary. Not to be confused with a canary. A catenary describes a curve something like that. Kind of like if you hang a wire between two poles. Catenary is a function. That describes uh, Which one was a bad one? This one. Curves like this. Of the form. 
let's see, e to the x plus e to the negative x over some constant. A linear combination of exponential functions. One's a decay function and one is a rising function. And you can put some sort of scaling factor with the x's and the exponent and some sort of scaling factor in front. You can do all kinds of modifications of one of these. But in particular, this one, e to the x plus e to the negative x over two has a name. This is called a hyperbolic cosine. And we abbreviate the hyperbolic cosine as COSH of the independent variable X. I've seen that. So this thing, you read that as COSH, the COSH of X. Make this sign a minus and you have the hyperbolic sign, E to the X minus E to the negative X over two is the hyperbolic sign of X. Cinch. That's the CH. Yeah. Guess what the hyperbolic tangent looks like? There's a Q in there. I'm guessing, I'm guessing e to the x minus e to the negative x over e to the x plus e to the negative x. Cinch over cosh. The hyperbolic tangent is the cinch over the cosh. E to the x minus e to the negative x over e to the x plus e to the negative x is the hyperbolic tangent. <coughs> that was hard to say, isn't it? It's just <laughs> 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 what do you think one over the cosine is called? One over the hyperbolic cosine. Hyperbolic secant. Each. One over the hyperbolic sine is the hyperbolic cosecant. One over the hyperbolic tangent is the hyperbolic cotangent. Now, can we do arc, arc cosh? You bet. There are arcs of these. Why don't you have to ask? I'm, in, I'm actually enjoying it. That's right. These are one-to-one -one functions if you limit their, their... One over the cosh is the set, such. I can't say this one either. There's another reason not to teach it. I can't say them. It's just a cough noise. I feel like <laughs> you, you need to learn German before you start teaching this. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> that was really good. <laughs> <laughs> right, so there are hyperbolics. I want you to take the derivative of the hyperbolic cosine by taking the derivative of this and tell me what you get. Oh. You take the derivative of the cosh. D by dx of the cosh. This is the derivative of the exponential function. Is it the negative e to the x minus e to the negative x over 2? Almost. Would you just tell me? The negative of the sine h. Why so would it be the negative, negative of it? It's just, it's just sine. Were you getting the negative of it? Well, I was thinking cosine of Yeah, sine. you were, but it's not. It's hyperbolic. I think right? It's so 2 is a constant, so you can pull it out. Yeah, just... Derivative of e to the x is e to the yeah. x. The derivative of e to the negative x is negative e to the negative x, so that changes the sign here. Oh, okay, you wrote the sign one. You wrote the sign one. Oh, I didn't mean to write the sign one. I'm writing this one. Yeah. It's the pen's fault. I did the same thing. So it becomes a hyperbolic sign. So it becomes a hyperbolic sign. Yes, yeah, but not a negative, is it? No, it's negative out front, which makes that e to the minus e to the x minus e to the negative x. We just put the negative inside it. And so that's equal to this guy. Now take the derivative of this one. You do the same thing. That comes back. That changes the sign. 
And so you get the hyperbolic cosh. So they're derivatives of each other. They're derivatives of each other. You don't even have to remember the sign. Oh, yes. Guess what the antiderivative is? Oh, it's the same thing. Go back and forth, right? The integral of the cinch is the cosh. The integral of the cosh is the cinch. Does it work the same way for the hyperbolic secant, hyperbolic cosecant, or not? Let's find out. <laughs> Take the derivative of this <laughs> using the quotient rule. And this is basically oh. because it's Ooh. ease. You can you don't need to worry about signs. Like, That's right. We're going to take the derivative of this. So you can use the quotient rule on this, or you can use the quotient rule on that, because you know what the derivatives of these are. So let's do derivative by taking these, and then we can take it from there. What are we doing? The We're going to take the derivative of the hyperbolic tangent. Okay. We're going to take the derivative of that by looking at the derivative in terms of the hyperbolic sine and cosine. One minus. What's the quotient? Okay. High minus high low. Draw a line down below. Denominator squared above. Hey. Wow. <laughs> I like that. Bars. <laughs> bottom times through the top minus the top times through the bottom oh. over the bottom squared. Oh, wait. Oh, wait, did I just invent the quotient rule? Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to slap you guys around a bit. <laughs> You're forgetting the wrong thing. <coughs> Forget stuff yeah. in other classes. Don't forget yeah, calculus. Cosh yeah. squared minus cinch squared. Cinch squared. Cosh squared. Yeah. All right. And we got the bottom. So then you, oh, yeah, you're right. Times the derivative of the top. Tangent H squared. Bottom times the top minus the top times the derivative of the bottom. Derivative of the bottom, I said. Mm -hmm. Is there? Put that green line in. I didn't mean to put them. Foreshadowing. Is there Pythagorean identities for these? About, about to discover that. Is the one minus tan squared of these as well? Yeah. yeah. I don't know how to say it. That's tan. honestly probably right. Radically one minus tan squared. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so the question was what the heck is that? One minus tangent h squared. Yeah. Well, what I want to do now is put this in there where the hyperbolic cosine is and square it. I want to find out what the numerator simplifies to because I know what one over cosh is. That's the hyperbolic secant. One over cosh squared should be the hyperbolic secant squared is what we think the derivative of the hyperbolic tangent should get. So I'm kind of thinking, hmm, I wonder if the numerator adds to one. So let's look, <laughs> let's look at what Cosine, hyperbolic cosine squared minus hyperbolic sine squared simplifies to. By writing it in terms of their ease. I have, a, I have a math question. Ask me a math question. This is a math class. If you have, <laughs> if you have two things that are proportional to each other raised to the same power, do they keep that proportionality? Like, like, let's say, let's say it's. I mean, we can kind of look at it right now. Let's say it's. No, they wouldn't actually. Never mind. You can, yeah, let's say, let's say it's two minus one, right? Square both when you have four minus one, they don't keep the same proportionality. Correct. Squaring is not a linear operator. Proportionality is linear. Okay, so next question is what is so I'm going to put this in there and square it, subtract that squared. e to the x plus e to the negative x over 2 squared minus 
e to the x minus e to the negative x over two squared. We can square the denominators and get that they're over four. So I'm just gonna pull that over four out here. All right, let's square this. You get the first term squared, e to the two x. You get the product of these two terms done twice. What's the product of these two terms? <coughs> e to the x times e to the negative x is one. You get that done twice. So you get a plus two in the middle and then plus the last term squared, e to the minus two x. I factored out that one fourth, so I'm gonna keep the minus sign here. Same deal, e to the two x. This product gives you a negative one. It's going to be done twice. And then minus, minus gives me a plus, e to the minus two x. Now let's take the parentheses off that second batch and the first batch and distribute the minus sign. And what happens? What's in that brackets there? Well, it becomes four. It's four in that bracket, doesn't it? Two and two gives me four. Oh, that's one. So just as we thought, this is one. <laughs> and so that's the hyperbolic secant squared. So there are parallels all over the place between our trig functions. Yes, sir. And that's also the hyperbolic, or one minus hyperbolic tangent squares, because you broke it up into cos squared over cos squared minus. Correct. So the Pythagorean identities look a little bit different. They're, they've got minus signs where the plus signs were. But the <coughs> derivatives don't have any minus signs. The derivative of, what do you think the derivative of the hyperbolic secant is going to be? Secant. Hyperbolic secant times the hyperbolic tangent, all that follows. But the Pythagorean identity is different. R squared minus sin squared is positive one. Um, and then if you divide by gosh squared, I, I divide everything by hyperbolic cosine. I get one minus the hyperbolic tangent is equal to the hyperbolic secant squared. Right? Our identity was one plus tan <coughs> secant squared. One plus tan squared secant squared, but one minus hyperbolic secant, hyperbolic tangent and hyperbolic secant. All right, so if you can do derivatives, you can do antiderivatives. Let's go backwards. Um, you can do U to U substitutions. You can find critical numbers. You can do everything you did with calculus if you know the derivative rules and things like that. Well, that was just an introduction. That was just an introduction. Does, what's, I was, you, no, you go ahead. No, you go ahead. No, you <laughs> probably have a more productive question. I was going to say, why are these functions special? Why do they get the special name? And like, what's what's the use? They for show up in applications, these linear combinations, one of these in different. Um, and so instead of always having to do this crapola, Right, in terms of E, if you just remember them in terms of their compact functions, oh, okay. then it, it makes things faster. It saves, yeah, saves you some time. Okay. So, like I said, I, I, I've been in math all my life and I used them in class maybe twice. Once was when I learned it in calculus two. And then one time I took a course called Calculus of Variations in grad school. And it just talked about different surfaces, calculus on different surfaces. And so if you have like a, a n-dimensional surface that has concavity in it, you can describe parts of that surface with hyperbolic functions instead of a linear combinations of these just to make it faster. So in my real life, I don't encounter them, except for right now, this is part of my real life. <laughs> 
So you can get away with it, but it makes for interesting reading. Let me see if there's anything other than that that I want in here. If you will fix it to and let it hang out, the force of gravity will naturally form a hyperbolic cosine curve. Would it hang her? If you hang a rope, fix the two ends, and let it hang under the force of gravity, it will naturally form a hyperbolic That's cosine. That's literally what she just said. Yeah. That's right. That was the like, first That's thing she right. said. Okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm reading. I'm, I'm interested now. Well, these are one to one functions. So oh. You can define inverse oh. hyperbolics. Velocity addition in special relativity isn't linear, but becomes linear when expressed in terms of hyperbolic tangent functions. Mm -hmm. Whoa, <laughs> <laughs> I like your funny words. <laughs> <laughs> but I'll let you read about the inverse hyperbolics. That that is something is also mm -hmm, bizarre. Um, but 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 one of your web work questions, uh, I think I may have put it on this web work, was asking you to do something like this. This was in 7.5. I don't know if I assigned it to you or not, but it's in the book. We can do this without hyperbolics, and we are. How do you do this interval? Partial fractions. Oh. We'd have to do a U to U if we were going to do partial fractions, and we don't have a U to U integral. Factor yeah. E to the X. Multiply by one. Multiply by one is kind of quick. It's the same thing as factoring. You see a value of one that you want to use? You can do the conjugate function. Okay, what's the conjugate going to look like? E to the X minus E to the negative X. Okay, so let's see what happens if we do that. I don't know if that's going to work, but I'm going to give it a try. Not going to work with this marker. <laughs> it almost looks silver. Okay. So what, what do you get on the bottom? E to the 2x minus e to the negative 2x. Yeah, so how does that help us? Yeah. Now we, well, no, now we can substitute e, u for e to the x, we get u squared, right? Wait. I think it made a worse problem. Probably. <laughs> so, but then at the top, you don't have a u squared, you just have a u. Yeah. Wait. Where do you see a u squared? And I certainly so don't see a, a, a D. I don't see a D. Oh, no, oh, yeah. Well, I'm not going to vote for that one. Let's cut it in half. How about we try just that? See if that helps. And when you say you see if that helps, you mean I know this will help. This is the answer. I don't know much of anything. Can we make it look like a <laughs> hyperbolic function? We can, but it doesn't mean we don't know hyperbolics. Oh. Okay, so if I multiply this out, we get an e to the x here, an e to the 2x here. What do I get here? That's one. You know how to do this integral. Yeah, that's, oh. that's a u du integral. Remember, if this power is one degree more than that one, then we take u to be e to the x, du is e to the x. And we can write this as an inverse tangent integral. And we, we, we're dealing with tangents of some form, no matter what. But like the trick. I'm not sure I know what you mean. We, we either are going to deal with it with an H after it, like trig functions with an H after it, or trig with a. Maybe. So if u is e to the x, du is also e to the x. And this becomes the integral of one over u squared plus one du. 
And that's the arc tangent of u. And u is e to the x. Okay, so that though, if I had a two here, would be one over the hyperbolic cosine. So that would be the hyperbolic secant. Should have an integral formula similar to the integral of the secant. Natural log of secant. Natural log of a hyperbolic secant, maybe a plus, maybe a minus, a hyperbolic tangent. Right? Well, there are log definitions for the hyperbolics. That that's the inverse. <coughs> yeah, I don't know how to get into it. That would take some work. I don't feel like putting work into this section. But this can be done with hyperbolics. No, I just don't want to do it. And some of those trig sub integrals are hyperbolic trig functions that you can get away with not doing the trig sub. You've seen, you've seen things that look like, for instance, you've seen um, this integral. Ah. That doesn't work any better. Interval. I mean, the steps to do this integral. Without the square root sign, it's an inverse tangent, but with the square root sign, it was a trig sub. Uh, sub. And you get something that looks like you do your trig sub, <clears throat> and you're going to get something that looks like um, the natural log of x over something, here it's probably one, plus the square root of x squared plus one. And that is by definition, the inverse <laughs> hyperbolic sign. So that would save all the true substitutions if you knew that that was an inverse hyperbolic sign. But it's just memorization. So we don't like memorizing. We like to do the trig sub steps. Right? So, this, so that's the point of having hyperbolic trig functions and inverse hyperbolic trig functions where these kind of calculations appear all the time. And you don't want to go through all the steps. If you know the properties of the hyperbolics and inverse hyperbolics, it's a one liner. You go from here to here. Okay, but if you don't use them a lot of times, there's more stuff stuck into your memory and there's not enough room in my head anymore. Okay, all right, so I invite you to read that section. You know, don't wait for the Netflix movie or anything. And I want to start chapter eight. You will like chapter eight. You've liked everything so far. What's going to turn you away from Tal to now? I'm scared now. We're just going to keep going. Did you just make an audible grind in my class? Not just. Uh, it was, uh. Are we learning lots of new stuff that's not going to be on the test every day? No, we'll learn new stuff and put it on the test just to make it worth it. <laughs> Thank you a lot. The first. <laughs> yeah, I think it is a bonus question. Oh, Paying attention. Go, 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 go.
Hey, so bonus, bonus question hyperbolic function. Maybe, maybe. Please, bonus question hyperbolic function. Maybe. You like that, huh? I do. Golly. But <laughs> you like that. Get you guys to grab those hyperbolic functions. All right. Well, there's that nice juicy one. <laughs> Sequence. You've been dealing with sequences all your life. Right? In kindergarten, you had to complete the pattern. You have given some shapes and you had to complete the pattern. A much more restricted mind. Yeah, we're going to look at sequences that are just lists of numbers. Sequence is a list of numbers. Doesn't have to be numbers, but for us, it will be. To follow some sort of rule, hopefully. For example, here are some sequences. Fibonacci sequence. Uh, here's another sequence. I wonder what that one is. Yeah. Can you tell me about this one? Those are all examples of sequences. What's the big deal with sequences? What's the big deal with sequences? <laughs> yes. I'm glad you asked. <laughs> a sequence is an example of a function. It's a function that pairs the counting numbers to a real number. So we denote a sequence usually like this. A1. A2, A3, AN. We're going to talk about an infinite sequence. And if we describe it like this, the sequence is a function that maps our counting numbers. So our inputs belong as the subscript to the set of real numbers. <coughs> are, are you saying that the sequence has to be counting numbers? The subscript. The okay. subscript is the counting number. So I would define my sequence with these cute little brackets, right? Where else can you use cute little brackets? And then we put the general formula for the nth term here. And then it's assumed that that means that. A list of numbers based upon the formula. So I can come up with a formula that says this. You can see what I'm doing to generate these numbers, correct? Yeah. I'm adding four to the previous number. Well, I can describe that recursively. I can say that the next term is the term right in front of it with five added to it. Four, four, whatever number. With four added to it. But that's not a general formula. That's an example of a recursive formula. Right? Like you use when you're making a, a loop in computer science. Do this to the next term. Add four to the term to get the next one. Well, in, uh, if I want a function, I want to get this in a general formula. So let me see what it is that I'm doing here. I added four one time to get the second term. I added eight or four twice to get the third term. I added um, 12 or four three times to get the fourth term. So I want to get the nth term. How many fours do I have to add to that first term to get to the nth term? So if I say that this is one plus four times n minus one, I should be able to get to the nth term. 
If I simplify that, that says 4n minus 3. One of my brackets got bigger than my expression. So this sequence is described by the sequence 4n minus 3, right? When n is 1, I get 1. When n is 2, I get 5. When n is 3, I get 9. So it's giving me that list of numbers. This is called the general formula. <coughs> the nth term. Can you look at that second list of numbers and come up with a general formula to give me the nth term anywhere down the line? For the second one. <coughs> those terms generated. Now those are the squares of the counting numbers. One squared, two squared, three squared, four squared. So our general formula for our second example, whoo, brackets got carried away. <laughs> I do it's also adding um, every odd number. But you couldn't come up with a general formula doing that, right? right? Yeah, I can't come up with a general formula for that Fibonacci sequence. But what's being done here to generate those terms? N plus N well, minus it's, one. It's, it's A of yeah, N minus N one plus A of N minus two. N minus yeah, two. And we can write recursively. So if I want the nth term, I take the two terms before it and add them together. So the term two steps before it would be an N minus two. The term one step before it would be an N minus one. But I can't go with a nice general formula. Is there one uh, I don't know. You want to look that up. Our interest is going to be in the long-term behavior of terms in a sequence. In other words, does my sequence converge if it converges to one? We'll talk about that on Friday. We'll review for your test on Friday. So our test one week from today will be over to chapter seven. Now I'm going to review sheet. Uh, <laughs> Yes. <laughs> you said 7.8 will not be on there? 7.8 will not be on that test. Well, there's a question. Well, Google says there is a general formula. I don't think so. 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 I don't some graded ones up here, but I can't see right now. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. Yeah. All right. So how do I move a Zoom?